So we are at 11 o'clock and we will kick off. My name is Robert Hawking. I'd like to welcome you to the very first Big Blue Button World Conference. Um, it's been a crazy year and um, on the base of an, an application that grew out of a Canadian university to now supporting millions of students worldwide. Um, thanks in no small part or entirely to COVID. Um, I'd like to welcome you to this day. So day one, this four day conference, day one is all about educators. And so we've got a phenomenal keynote speaker, uh, which I'll, uh, who I'll introduce in a moment. Um, uh, and we will be following the keynote with three other great presentations uh, dealing with um, student engagement, as well as examples of students who've prospered in this time. And then with almost 2 billion minutes of learning through Big Blue Button, um, uh, what we've learned in the last year. And of course, in the following days, be different days dedicated to different streams for programmers, developers, uh, and uh, commercial partners. So we're incredibly excited to uh, welcome you all here today. Um, just one very quick housekeeping uh, uh, note. Um, we're very keen to hear your questions. So I would ask you to please um, post your questions in the chat. I'll be moderating the session and I'll do my best to make sure that Scott, um, our keynote today, has got your questions uh, when he's finished his presentation. So to lead off, I'd like to introduce one of the co-founders of Big Blue, Blue Button and the head uh, uh, administrator for the application, Fred Dixon. Fred? Thanks, Rob. So welcome everybody to the conference. Uh, what a journey. As Rob mentioned, we've been with this for over since 2007. Big Blue Button started in the classroom. So it was born in the classroom, not in the boardroom. We are an open source project. I see some familiar faces from our uh, familiar names from the community. And we have very deep integrations with the learning management system. For those of you who have used Big Blue Button, uh, welcome. This is a celebration of not only the progress of the project, but also the potential that we have to make the world a better place. And for reasons why the Blue Button exists, education is at the core of the next generation and of basically our planet. We have built Big Blue Button so it's available to anyone around the world. I believe it's localized into over 55 languages now. And it is so um, impressive to see what people around the world have done with it. So we have four days of stories and speakers and panelists to share those stories with the community and to give you a chance to participate. Robert, I'll hand it back to you. Great, well, thanks very much, Fred. So obviously one of the big things that has shifted for, for educators the world over is the fact that while we were seemingly inching towards uh, uh, the consistent role of technology in education, the last year or year or so has actually uh, forced it upon us. And uh, a lot of analysts say we are not going back. Whilst students may return to the classroom, disruption within, within classic forms of education, the education model, will never return uh, because of the changes that that education or rather technology has wrought on teaching. So I'd like to introduce our keynote for today. I'd like to introduce Scott McLeod. Scott is an Associate Professor of Educational Leadership at the University of Colorado, Denver. Um, Scott is, a, is widely recognized as one of the nation's leading experts on K-12 school technology leadership issues. He's the founding director of the UCEA Center for the University of Technology Leadership and Education and is the co-creator of the popular video series, Did You Know, Shift Happens. Scott has also written or edited three books, and contributed 170 articles, and we are so pleased to have Scott today share with us his views on how we will be innovating our way out of the pandemic. Scott, I'll hand over the floor to you. Hey, thank you very much. So hi, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, um, and we're just going to go ahead and get launched. We don't have a lot of time together, so hopefully you see some beautiful snowy mountains here coming up. Awesome. And uh, we're just going to dive right in and think about how to innovate out of this pandemic that we've been in. So as mentioned, I'm an associate professor of school leadership at the University of Colorado, Denver. I prepare some principals and superintendents. Um, I'm also the founding director of a center called CASEL. CASEL is the only univer university center in America, at least, that's focused on leadership and innovation and technology and deeper learning and so on. Um, and in that capacity, I get to work with school all around the world. 
in terms of what does it mean to be a future ready school system? How do we prepare students for life success in 2021 and beyond? Um, and so that's kind of what I do. It's a uh, really fun work, actually. I'm very visible online and social media and have been around since about 2006, blogging at Dangerously Irrelevant and so on. So just want to share a couple of big picture thoughts here before we dive in. Um, so I had a chance a couple of weeks ago to go back to Roanoke, Virginia. I don't know how many of you have ever been to Roanoke. If you have, you can come in in the chat. Um, Roanoke is where I was a middle schooler, and I got this invite to come back and work with my former school district that I was student in 40 years ago. Now, the first thing you should know about me as a middle schooler was that I was quite the looker, of course. Um, but I was digging through my old middle school yearbooks in preparation for this visit, and I discovered that I was in the math club. That's me in the front row, second from the left. Now, I didn't remember at all that I was in the math club until I saw these pictures again. Um, and what I loved about this picture right here was that here's Mr. Johnston. Check out, you know, all the facial hair and and uh, whatever up in the top right corner. But good old Mr. Johnston uh, called me a genius, which I'm sure was absolutely fabulous for me as a seventh grader, right? Um, in terms of self-esteem and respect and so on. But the other thing I want you to notice is this right here. And everybody else in this picture is looking at this one device that we happen to have in our school with sort of fascination, except for me. I have to look at my face that looks something like this, right? Um, and they're like, what the heck is this thing? What are we going to do with it? I have no idea what we're supposed to make of this. And, you know, middle school me didn't really know that the twin forces of technology and globalization were going to upend everything around us over the next few decades. And so, as we all know now, of course, um, we've been living through some incredibly rapid societal changes uh, represented in this graph by the green line on the screen. Um, and schools just in general have struggled to keep up, right? So as fast as the world is changing outside of school, school in many ways looks fairly traditional. Um, and we still do things the way we have from decades and decades ago. And when we have that change, uh, those differences in terms of change, rapid rates of change, and what we have are what we might call relevance gaps, right? So anytime when a school system can't keep up with society around it, then that's a possible relevance gap where, you know, what we have here is that what society needs from us, what students need from us, um, are not things that we're able to provide, at least in the moment, and we're working toward this. And so I think right now we have great parity that in most school systems, we've sort of recognized by now that we need to be doing more of this stuff with kids. Now, this is actually stuff I didn't get as middle school me. What I mostly got was factual recall and procedural regurgitation. Um, and yet, we're sort of recognizing today that, you know, we need more thinkers and problem solvers. We need to really burn our graduate pool to get those. We need students who are information literate and technology fluent. We need more, you know, global awareness and intercultural fluency. We need kids to be great communicators and collaborators and innovators and so on. And we see that reflected in a number of different school systems, learner profiles or profile of a graduate and so on. So, for instance, here's the Saline, Michigan area schools compass, um, what they call their learner profile that they start off back in 2016. And you can see the anchors of the compass, right? Collaboration, communication, critical thinking, creativity, we want kids to be globally connected, uh, ethical and responsible citizens, creative innovators, problem solvers, and so on, right? Uh, similarly, here's the Washoe School District in Reno, Nevada, in the U.S., and again, notice the 21st century competencies. These are competencies they want the graduates to have, and if you look at the bottom on those dark blue boxes, the same sort of buzzwords start to appear. Collaborators, knowledge constructors, real-world problem solvers, skilled communicators, and so on. Um, here is the profile of a graduate that the Roanoke County Public School created, the district that I just worked with, that I returned to after 40 years. Um, and you can see that they have eight C's, right? That's a lot of C's, by the way. Um, we've got citizenship, we've got communicative, we've got creativity, we've got centeredness, we've got critical thinking, we've got good career planning, and so on. So everybody's trying to revision what school should look like and what directions we should go and how we should operate. 
Now, one of the challenges, of course, of the pandemic was that it sort of put a halt to much of that kind of work. Um, during the pandemic, I had a chance to interview at least 43 different school leaders and school systems about how they were responding um, during this global crisis. I think what we saw over and over again was when the pandemic first hit, most schools were in phase one of uh, this chart, right? We were busy to figure out how do we make sure, at least in the U.S., that kids got fed, um, that we were attending to basic, you know, social emotional health needs. We were checking in with people. How are you doing physically, health wise, social emotionally, mentally, and so on. And then also, of course, for those families that didn't have it, trying to get basic computing devices, internet hotspots out, so that we had some semblance and chance doing some learning. And then once we got out of the access phase, then we slid into phase two, which I've labeled subsistence learning, which is basically the time period when we ramped up teachers and basic learning technologies, familiarized them with some new online platforms. And then unfortunately in most school districts, what we saw was sort of saw um, a strong emphasis on lower level knowledge work, that factual recall and procedural regurgitation that I talked about before, you know, the kind of stuff we see in worksheets and homework packets and so on, because that was about all that we could handle as school systems. In many rural areas and even some urban areas um, that didn't have access, we were literally delivering worksheet papers and packets to families on bus routes uh, because they didn't have technology access. And we were just dropping off huge chunks of stapled packets just to so have something that would drive their learning. Um, and so this past year, we got a little bit better on that subsist learning, but I think if you look across the spectrum of most schools, um, learning for most kids was pretty low level um, in terms of still basically focusing on content, basic procedures and so on. And so as we think about how do we innovate out of the pandemic, you know, to sort of return to whatever's next, I think we have sort of three approaches that we can take and I'd like to invite you to consider each of those. Um, and I labeled those reorientation, reinvention, and rising to the challenge. Now reorientation is where we basically just return to what was. It's this idea that we're gonna go back to normal. Um, if we had to express this idea in an image, it might look something like this, right? A very exhausted educator who's been struggling all year plus to interact with students through a screen. Um, and basically this educator is just saying how quickly to get back to what we were doing before the pandemic. And we have plenty of educators and plenty of school systems who would just be absolutely delighted if we could just go back to what we were doing before. Now, another way to think about coming out of the pandemic is to think about this idea of reinvention. Uh, and reinvention, we might say, can we rethink what we did before, do it a little bit better. Uh, Kurt Lewin, who's a famous uh, school leadership guru, talks about this idea of if you want to make a change in the school system, you need to unfreeze current practices, then you need to change them to whatever you want them to be instead, and then you need to refreeze them in place. And it's really that change and refreeze area, the organizational magic starts to happen, right? And so my Heidi Hayes Jacobs has this wonderful quote, you know, we have to start thinking about how we'll go back to school, but how we go forward to school. And I love that idea, right? Instead of going back to normal, how do we go forward to whatever our new normal is going to be? And if you had to represent this idea in an image, you know, we might steal the image of grew from Despicable Me as he freezes things in place um, and so that he can do whatever he needs to do, right? And so as we think about what's occurred in our own school systems, we have made enormous technology upgrades at school. We focused on a variety of ways to give kids and families better internet access at home. We've seen both teachers and students exhibit new mindsets and skill sets. Um, over the past year plus, in many of our school systems, we've recognized that we needed to renew our emphasis equity and all the various curricular and instructional issues and organizational issues that go along with that. Of course, we've evolved a number of incredible new learning modalities, and those are both digital, hands-on, active, sometimes very high levels of agency with kids, lots of other innovations in our school systems that we can sort of tap into, right? And I'm guessing that as you think about that list that's on the screen right now and some of the innovations and changes that you've seen in your own schools over the last 
year and a half or so, that there are probably many of those that you would love to freeze in place um, as we move forward rather than just revert back to what was before the pandemic. So there's a third way to think about coming out of the pandemic, which is a little bigger picture. And this is this idea of rising to the challenge of the era, not just the moment. Um, and how do we start from some new bold directions? And if we had to capture this idea in an image, then it might look something like, you know, good old Buzz Lightyear, his infinity and beyond cry. And so school systems that I'm working with right now are focused primarily on four big shifts as we head out of the pandemic. The first shift is shift from lower level recall regurgitation that I mentioned before to those higher level thinking and problem solving. And that's shift number one. Second shift is really around agency. You know, the deeper learning schools that I work with are trying to figure out how do we let kids drive their own learning more often? You know, if you look at most school systems, mission or vision statements, they say something along the lines of blah, 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 lifelong learners, blah, blah, blah. Or maybe it's blah, 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 future ready graduates, blah, blah, blah. But in whatever your vision statement looks like, it probably indicates some instance of students being self-sufficient learners and actors in the world around them when they leave your organization. And yet, in most schools, we also often tell kids what to do almost every minute of every day up until they graduate. And so we have this disconnect between what we say we want graduates to be and how we actually operate with our students while we have them. Now, the cognitive psychologists tell us that the number one factor of human motivation is autonomy. Nobody likes to be micromanaged. Everybody likes to have some control and ownership over what they do, when and how, and so on. And unfortunately, schools tend to be low autonomy spaces for most students. So the second shift to agency has several different payoffs. One is it allows us to tap into student motivation and engagement in a different way because as students gain autonomy, they gain motivation. Uh, second big benefit, of course, is that we start fulfilling our mission and vision statements by actually allowing kids to have agency over their own learning while they still have caring adults around them to guide them, rather than just turning them loose after they graduate and say good luck, even though you've never had any experience with that. And then third, of course, is that it allows us to personalize, individualize, and differentiate the learning process in ways that aren't possible when we control everything ourselves as educators. Third big shift is around ethic work. You know, since time immemorial, young people have always asked, why do I need to know this? Why do I care? What meaning or relevance does this have to me now or later in my life? And when we start taking student learning work and connecting it to the real world outside of the classroom and outside of this building, right, local communities, online communities, global communities, they stop asking most of those questions because they start to find meaning relevance in the kind of work that they have to do. The fourth big shift is on tech infusion. It's the shift analog to digital. Many of us were traveling that journey for a long time now. You know, um, we've been trying to get technology into schools since I was a middle schooler 40 years ago. Um, and bearing levels of success. Now, of course, the pandemic accelerated that for many of our school systems, right? Many just that in schools that were not one-to-one -one before, that were not giving their kids a computing device, all of them had to ramp up and do that. And that's an important shift. We want our kids to be information right. We want our kids to be technology fluent. So that fourth shift is a big, is important. But technology is never the end goal. Technology is always should be a tool to help us accomplish something more. And so whenever I work with schools, I always say technology for the purpose of what. And we know is that technology can be a really powerful lever to make those first three shifts happen, right? Like we can just have kids think, do thinking work different ways. They can have agency and ownership of the learning work in different ways. They can do more real world authentic work with technology than they can with it. So as we head out of the pandemic, you know, the schools that I'm working with are trying to lean hard into those four shifts and really think about what are the phases phases three and phases four on the chart, and we really start making sure that we continue our journeys towards deeper learning rather than recall and regurgitation. We're designing for agency and interactivity. We're continuing to play around with teaching and learning modalities. We're paying more attention to equity, and we're really trying to design future learning opportunities based on the new skills we've gained over the past year and a half. And as we start to do that, we're going to make school different in a lot of different ways. 
So I think we have a number of opportunities in front of us, and I'm going to highlight three in particular. Uh, I'm going to talk about new learning possibilities, some personalization chances here, and this idea of engagement. So if you think about new learning possibilities, you know, I alluded to this a little bit already, it's this idea that the technology is here to stay, right? Like we're not going to go back to more analog senses. And so as my buddy Will Richardson says, how do we figure out ways to really create opportunities for kids to connect, to collaborate, to create, to really do work that matters? Um, and I think technology really helps us. And if we're leaning into these new learning possibilities, then during during the pandemic and as we went out, we can ask ourselves some great questions, right? Like what new technology tools and online platforms do we now have in our talks that we didn't have before? What new mindsets and learning modalities have we created over the last year plus? And how can we build on these the next school year? Second big opportunities around personalization. Um, and I'm not talking about this personalization where we have kids uh, in front of drill and kill learning software where we digitize and jump the curriculum, right? I'm talking about something a little different. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and pop over to a video instead. And I'm gonna share the kind of personalization I mean uh, when I talk about this concept. This models. So instead, what we did as a staff was we developed a personal project that asked our students, students to focus on one of, one of four, four domains. domains. A personal, personal interest, interest that you've never really had the time, time to develop. develop. A skill a from a loved one, one or a family, family member, member you always wanted to learn, learn but have never had time, time to learn. To learn. An online-based online skill, skill, perhaps from a free open source website, website that you've always wanted to learn, learn, and maybe there's a way for you to learn that. And then, and then the fourth, the fourth one, one is something creative, creative out outside of your comfort zone. Do you want to make something? Do you want to build something? One of my advisees decided to build owl boxes out of uh, some used wood that was in her father's garage. So the question was simply, how are you going to challenge yourself? And even if it's not necessarily knit towards your personal career trajectory, what is something that's going to fill you up and that's going to challenge you? And we had our students just with gusto take those projects on. The other gift that I think the coronavirus time has offered us is the massive, well, how well this illustrated that meaningful inquiry-based learning that is connected to students' passions will create interest regardless of a grade. You know, so many of us as teachers, even if we do believe in something like the big picture platform, it's hard to let go of this idea that I have to grade something for it to be valuable. Um, the old adage, right? Kids won't do it unless it's graded. Well, this time absolutely upended that. And what we discovered was the two classes that had the highest amount of engagement were the two teaching teams that designed the project that was most closely connected to what the students were experiencing. So as a staff to be able to dig into that and to say, you know, maybe it's okay. So we looked at all teachers designed around, I call them our three buckets. Bucket number one, what do you really think kids need right now? Do you want them to be writing? Do you want them to be reading? The second bucket is, what would be nice for them to continue to practice? Maybe something that we were doing that I want them to continue to. And what are the places online that there might be some really cool stuff for kids to experience? And then the third one is, what is the stuff that I often don't even want to teach anyway that kids just do not need right now? And so we looked at those three buckets and we gave ourselves grace and permission to completely ignore bucket number three. <laughs> and instead to say, how do we find the things kids want to practice and do well? Marry that with the skills that are important. Kids do need to be reading and writing and making and doing and ideating, right? So how do we make that happen? And All right. So what you hear from Melissa there is a much more creative way to think about personalization, even during the pandemic, right? And to really hear some fantastic adaptability from her educators around how to make those deeper learning opportunities happen, even if they're online or remote or blended and so on. 
So as we come out of the pandemic, we need to ask ourselves, what kind of new structures did we create to differentiate for our groups of learners? Also, what new structures did we create to personalize for individual learners? What kind of new choice pathways and other opportunities did we make and how can we build upon those next year? Third opportunity for us as we come out of the pandemic, I think, is related to engagement. It's this idea that even before the engagement, even before the pandemic, uh, student engagement was pretty much in the tank. Um, these are some numbers from the folks who do the Gallup polls here in America. And you can see that, at least in the West, our engagement numbers are terrible. It's not too bad in fifth grade, uh, but we've already lost about one out of four. And if you ask kids if they're engaged in their learning, in high school, you elect one out of three kids says yes. And it's no wonder because we have some follow-up questions from Gallup that sort of explain how this works. Uh, in the last seven days, students, have you learned anything interesting? Are you having fun at school? Are you getting to do what you do best? The answers routinely are no, no, and no. And those numbers just got worse during the pandemic for most of us uh, as we really struggled with remote and blended modalities and trying to keep them engaged through screens when they were at home and had more of an uh, ability to opt out. So I think we had to do some really hard looks uh, about during the pandemic what actually worked well with student engagement and of course what didn't. And then, you know, in the schools that I'm working with, they're asking questions like, how did we capture those deeper learning and student agency and authentic work opportunities and use technology in rich ways to help age our learners and how do we build upon those next year? We know, of course, that if we want those things to happen, they don't just happen by magic. We have to design for them. And just as an aside, uh, there's a free four shifts protocol that you can use uh, that my colleague Julie and I plan to help with those transitions. So if you're interested in some of that, you can go to that web address and check it out um, and have some fun and start some redesign dialogue and stay in touch if I can be of help on that front. So, uh, the biggest barrier to change is actually not um, mandated assessments or lack of school resources. It actually are deeply rooted mindsets of what school should look like. You know, you say to most adults the word school and a whole host of images pop into mind. And cracking those open and changing those is actually really difficult. Uh, as I said uh, famously back in 2014, if you want student learning to change but you don't want to change teaching and schooling, well, good luck with that. So here's a number of assumptions that are held pretty deeply by educators and institutions. And you can read through those pretty quick. The student can't be trusted to do their own learning. The ability to pass exams is the best criteria. What presents is what they learn, uh, and so on, right? And then recognize that these assumptions are still held in most schools and most educators uh, in many ways. And yet that list came from 1969 from Carl Rogers, the famous psychologist. And of course, the pandemic and technology has upended most of that, right? So we know, of course, that technology actually helps students drive their own learning. And that whole child approaches and applied deeper learning also are important in addition to those exams. We know that students' uh, learning is fostered primarily by meaning making, right? That's where we get the best retention, not just presentation by educators. You know, we pretend that kids learn stuff and they forget it three weeks later. And it makes that meaning by doing things, not just by regurgitating stuff that seems irrelevant to them. We know that if we want creative adults, we have to have creative learners who have agency over that learning work. And we know that students deserve to be treated with dignity rather than manipulable objects and so on. So there's the famous saying, never waste a good crisis, right? And so if we're going to actually rise to the challenge of the era, not just of the moment, uh, if we're really going to lean into sort of that Buzz Lightyear, Tiffany and Beyond uh, modality, then we're going to have to do some hard shifts as school systems, right? We're going to have to somehow combat those, all those yes buts that we always come up with, right? Many school systems allow those resistance points to dominate and defeat promising ideas. And instead, we want to reframe opposition into possibility. We want to figure out, instead of asking yes, but, how do we start asking why not and how can we? And the way we do that is we figure out how to create these new visions of possibility that outweigh all of our fears, our control issues, our assumptions about what it should look like, our institutional inertia, and all those yes, buts that we always come up with. 
bottom line is ultimately we all know that higher level thinkers don't just magically emerge from low level think spaces. And we also know that in our hearts, the best learning experiences are hands on and applied, immersed in the real world. We know that true deep learning is rarely linear. It's almost never really organized by chapters and sections. We know that authentic, powerful learning rarely takes the form of a worksheet or end of chapter review problems or multiple choice quiz. And so as school systems, as we head out of the pandemic, we're gonna to have to ask ourselves two really big questions. One of them is, what do we want our students and graduates to be? We want them to be recipients of pre-made, pre-packaged information that gets delivered to them. Or do we want them to be bakers and makers and creators and doers who are actively engaged in their learning and who are doing awesome things that hopefully make a difference in the world? And if you want that, then the second big question is, what are we willing to do as organizations to get those graduates? We're coming out of the pandemic. This is the beginning of anything that we want. It's been a hell of a year. Educators and schools have risen to the challenge and everything that society has ever thrown at them. Let's keep at it. Let's go get them. Thanks for spending some time with me today. Take care. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, I thought that was a fascinating presentation. We've got a few questions um, that I will I'll, I'll share with you now. So first question comes from Jim. What types of computing devices were available to students uh, and what was the percentage of delivery to students and families? Are you aware of that number? Uh, that, of course, varied widely from school system to school system. We saw that schools that were already one one and giving kids devices were well ahead of the ones that had to scramble. Um, most schools actually had some had sufficient numbers of devices in the school uh, when you started counseling, when you started counting up classroom sets, computers on carts, computers in media centers, and so on. Um, they just had to get them out to kids and families and give them permission to finally take them home for the first time. Um, I don't know what the mix was. You know, I think Chromebooks and iPads are pretty popular here in the States because of their affordability factor. A number of districts are also providing full-fledged laptops. I don't know exactly what the percentage there is. Um, and again, who was one-to-one -one and who wasn't? Very widely from region to region, district to district, state to state, and so on. Okay, thanks. And we have another question uh, from someone in Germany. Question is, is there any research that, and it's a great, a great question actually, is there any research that's asked about what the future hybrid offers will look like? Um, so research usually studies what's happening or what's happened in the past, not what's heading forward. Um, I think we have a number of indicators down the road that kids are gonna be continuing to use technology to drive their own learning in creative ways. And that's going to proceed at whatever pace these educators are comfortable with and we as school systems are comfortable with. And so we've got a number of innovative school systems out there, like the ones that I work with, that are really trying to hand things over to kids as quickly as possible, let them own and drive more of their own learning. They're striving for better engagement, higher levels of agency, more real world work, deeper learning, and so on. And we've got lots of other systems who are moving much slower on those fronts and uh, are not willing yet to give up sort of the dominant industrial model of education that has with us for a long time. Now, I, um, I, we, we've got an interesting question from Craig Henry, um, and I'd like to combine it with a question I have, actually. You know, I'm, as I sit here today, I've got three kids that are that uh, are uh, learning at different stages uh, online. And I don't think I've spoken to too many teachers or parents that say that this this year was a home run in terms of the quality of the education that their kids are getting. So my question is, and then I'll combine it with Craig Henry's, is it really is hard to feel optimistic, uh, particularly when you see those student engagement numbers. So what needs to happen within the culture of education for it to accept and embrace technology more widely? And is it better technology, better technology solutions, or is it teachers that um, need to be less complacent and embrace change more comfortably? Yeah, it's 
I mean, we obviously want to make sure that every kid has adequate technology access. And that's both in terms of internet bandwidth and in terms of a device, right? But it's beyond that, it's actually not so much about the technology. We have a variety of technologies, including robust tools like Big Blue Button, that allow us to do some really interesting things with kids. What we really have to do is we have to rethink learning modalities and teaching modalities, right? And so as a parent of school-aged children myself, you know, I think what we saw over and over again was that kids really struggled with translating the transmission regurgitation model of learning to remote environments. So traditional teaching and learning looks like information gets transmitted out by the teacher, by the textbook, by something you found on the web, whatever, right? And then the kids regurgitate that back to us, and we give kids good grades based on how well they regurgitate, right? You regurgitated from the textbook well, you regurgitated from my lecture well on this quiz or exam or whatever, and so you get an A. And if you don't regurgitate well, then we punish you behaviorally, economically, whatever. And when we have kids in the classroom, we can sort of force them to engage in that dynamic, that transmission regurgitation dynamic. But boy, when kids were home, that didn't work very well, right? When you have you know, learners at home and pushing forward uninspiring learning tasks in front of them that are low-level thinking, they're uh, boring and disengaging, and kids just are struggling to find meaning and relevance in the learning tasks. At home, they could opt out in a different way that they could at school, right? So agency at home was to say no. And now at school, are we just going to force them back into the same old uninspiring learning recognizing that they have less of an ability to say no, are we actually going to re-examine the learning that we're putting in front of them and create different kinds of opportunities for them? And those are the schools that I'm working with, the schools that are focused on the four big shifts and saying, how can we make learning different? How can we make school different for kids, right? Of course, we're going to use technology to make those opportunities happen because you can be a deeper thinker, you can do more authentic work, you can have more agency, right, with tech than without it. But the shift is in the learning tasks that we put in front of them, not necessarily just in the tech. And I think we can do that. And I think we see, as Melissa showed us in the video, that we have some incredible opportunities for kids to re-engage and to learn some power in directions. You know, it is amazing as a parent to my kids can spend pretty much uh, limitless time in front of a screen as long as the content's right. But they can only spend about five minutes focusing on school learning on a screen. I, I agree with you. I think maybe there needs to be a, a shift in the way the content is delivered. Right. Um, we have another question um, from Delphina in India, and it's, can you share any suggestions on how we can get more schools to use software solutions like Big Blue Button? So, you know, uh, I think it's always around the value proposition, right? So whenever I'm working with school leaders, remember I'm a leadership guy, uh, you have to figure out what the pitch is to admins about the kind of learning that will be enabled by the tool. So, you know, if you're just coming in and selling uh, a more extensive version of what you already do, then that's a pretty hard sell for an administrator to make the purchase. So I think you want to frame the request of administrators in terms of if we get this new piece of software like the blue button, then here's the kinds of things we can do with kids that we can't do without it. And those things are worth the purchase price. So make your pitch accordingly in framing of what kind of powerful opportunities for kids can we create with the software? Not just will it make us as educators more efficient. Um, you know, the classic example of this is the big wave we had in schools where everybody went out and purchased smart boards, right? These interactive whiteboards, uh, brands, and, you know, learning didn't change much. I used to lecture at you from the front of the room with a chalkboard. Now I lecture at you from the front of the room with a $4,000 interactive whiteboard. Well, that's great. We spent four grand instead of a hundred bucks to do the same kind of learning and teaching. Like that's not a good sell for an administrator, right? So you have to pitch what kind of learning and teaching will be different. That's worth the cost. And that's the value proposition you have to make to your school leaders. Well, that's, that's interesting, Scott. So we're coming up to um, uh, the end time on this presentation. Yeah. So I'm going to pose one more question. Um, and that is, uh, I had a teacher recently say that if online education was to work, um, students would need full-time tutors sitting next to them. And I'm actually, to be honest with you, 
Right now, the full-time tutors that are sitting next to them are, are their parents who are often working from home. So we haven't actually spoken to parent, about parents yet. What do you think needs to change in the mindset of parents to make this a success going forward? I think what was interesting about the pandemic was that many parents saw direct firsthand how uninspiring to the learning was that their kids experienced at school, right? And because we don't usually go to school and next to our kid every day in the classroom, we didn't really see that. We got glimpses of it at parent-teacher conferences, right, as tears handed over big packets of worksheets and homework packets that our kids had to do. But our kids came home. Most kids come home relatively happy from school most of the time because they're interacting with friends and it's a social time and so on. But we got some really deep glimpses into the learning work itself from home as parents sitting side by side with our kids trying to support them not just on home but in the day-to-day classwork as well. And so I would actually say to parents that to the extent that you found great things happening during that pandemic time or you saw things where you wish your kids learning really different to start engaging your school in that community, in that conversation. Um, because schools will revert back to what was, to relatively uninspiring transmission regurgitation model of teaching and learning, unless we press them a little bit as communities to do something different, right? And when we have tools like Big Blue Button and other technology that allow us to do some really interesting interactive and also self-supported learning for kids, we should be leaning into those, not away from those. But that requires a conversation between communities, parents, schools, educators, and children about what do we want learning and teaching to look like instead. And that's the point I tried to make at the end is that we need to sort of reopen the dialogue about what do we want our graduates to be and what are we willing to do to get those. I think your, your points are a wonderfully provocative because, you, you know, it is unavoidable. Technology is unavoidable today. And all you've got to do is take a look at how, uh, how much younger kids are today when they get their hands on a device and how meaningful it is as a vehicle and, and a window in the world. It is not going away. So I just want to say thank you very much. Thank you for all of the people that have joined us this presentation. I'd like to invite you now um, to join us in the next session, which is creating engagement in the new classroom lessons on keeping students focused with virtual learning. So thank you very much, Scott. It is a pleasure meeting you and hearing from you. Um, very much appreciate it. Bye, everybody. Thanks for your time.